another quarter in the books. Uh, Krista, nice to see you. Good to see you. So as we always do, uh, why don't we start with some framing of what happened in the quarter around uh, market moving economic data, as well as uh, any relevant central bank activity. Okay, great. So let's start with inflation. Uh, inflation continues to grind lower. In both Canada and the U.S., inflation has actually come in below where central banks were expecting it. So inflation in Canada is now sitting at 2%. Over the quarter, it fell from around 2.9 to 2. So it's been a pretty big move. Uh, in the U.S., the move wasn't quite as big, but con inflation continues to grind lower with headline PCE now sitting at two and a quarter. So inflation over the quarter has moved much closer to central bank targets and is effectively at target uh, in Canada. In terms of growth, uh, we have seen some weakness in growth. You know, last quarter, it seemed like PMIs might be starting to trend higher. This quarter, that completely reversed. We now have 70% of countries surveyed are contracting, and that includes the U.S. and China. And so as a result, global PMIs peaked at the end of last quarter and have now moved below 50 Data-wise, I think the big story over the quarter, at least as it pertains to central bank activity and, and the Fed, was U.S. employment. Uh, the latest release we got last week actually shows, was actually decent and showed that the unemployment rate was flat over the quarter at 4.1. But throughout Q3, we were seeing a weaker uh, picture with respect to the labor market. And I think a big factor was there was a significant downward revision of about a million jobs over the last few years. And I think that rebasing of the employment picture was one of the drivers of the Fed's policy decision. So in terms of monetary policy, you know, last quarter, we, we saw the global easing cycle begin. We saw the Bank of Canada cut, the ECB cut, uh, as well, central banks started talking about the risks being more balanced. This quarter, that continued. There was a big move out of the Fed. They cut 50 basis points in September. Uh, the ECB uh, cut, they actually cut a stealth sort of 60 basis points. They cut their deposit facility by 25, uh, but their lending rate by 60. And it's really that lending rate that's going to feed through to the economy as that's the level banks borrow at. Uh, we also saw the Bank of England cut rates. And this morning we saw the, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand cut 50 basis points. Uh, in terms of the Bank of Canada, the Bank of Canada had two meetings over the quarter and they cut 25 basis points at both meetings. So they've now cut 75 basis points in total, taking the overnight rate from 5% to four and a quarter. So in summary, inflation risks have diminished, uh, downside risks to growth and employment have increased. And as such, central banks are responding with easier policy. And I would expect global central banks to continue easing here as they move rates uh, towards neutral. So given that sort of slowdown in economic data, and then also combining that with the Fed taking a larger first cut uh, than what the Bank of Canada did, do you think that that move by the Fed gives the Bank of Canada license to go 50 on the next meeting or in a future meeting? Or was that already sort of something that was factored in uh, prior to the Fed move? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what the Fed has done, the ECB, and now the Reserve Bank of New Zealand does give the Bank of Canada a bit more cover to go aggressively if they feel it's appropriate. Um, I think the bigger driver is going to be, does the Bank of Canada feel like more aggressive policy is necessary at this stage? And on that, there's sort of two things I would point to that you know could suggest the bank is a bit behind relative to their outlook. The first is inflation. You know, we already talked about inflation falling pretty materially uh, uh, last quarter definitely faster than the Bank of Canada was expecting with headline at two. And the bank has said in the past, you know, as you get closer to your inflation target, your risk management calculus changes. And so that alone, sort of the fact that they're at target with, with respect to inflation, but still quite a bit above neutral, uh, might suggest to them that they could go more aggressively. Um, the other factor is that growth component. And growth did come in modestly weaker than, than they were expecting. I don't think the level of growth is necessarily that far off uh, from where they were expecting. But more importantly, there's definitely questions around the momentum of growth. The Bank of Canada had expected growth to pick up here, uh, and that doesn't seem to be the case. And so that could cause them to go more aggressively. Having said that, our, our view is still that they go 25 basis points at each meeting, sort of consistent with what they've been doing. But it's tough to say that 50 isn't on the table at this point. We spoke last time about the inverted yield curve, so front-end yields being higher than uh, some longer bonds. Uh, 
we started to see a little bit of a normalization. I guess that had already started, but we saw a bit more of it in the quarter. Uh, can you give us an update on what happened to the curve? Yeah, we've definitely seen some normalization on the curve. You know, there's that three month or overnight uh, 10 year curve that's still inverted uh, about 100 basis points. That's the one the Fed often points to. Uh, but the broader curve, call it the twos, tens curve, is now in positive territory. And, you know, we've mentioned in the past that, you know, when curves are inverted, it's because the market believes policy is sufficiently restrictive. And if you keep policy restricted for an extended period of time, you obviously run the risk of a recession. So we have started seeing some normalization, but I do think it's important to keep in mind why we've got this normalization. First, obviously, it's because, you know, central banks are easing policy. The Fed has started kind of easing policy. But the other reason is that the market expects them to continue to do so. So the market is expecting another 150 basis points by the Fed by the end of next year. And that would take the Fed funds rate from 5% uh, today to 3.5%. And so if the Fed follows through with that, uh, we should expect the curve to remain positive. But if the Fed doesn't ease to the extent that the market believes, um, we should expect the curve to see uh, to revert somewhat. And I think the the question often is, you know, okay, so now we've got a positive curve. Does that mean we've skated by the recession? Uh, and again, I think that's yet to be determined. Um, however, all else equal, a faster, more aggressive central bank does reduce the the probability that a recession happens. Uh, now, in Canada, it's very similar story. Um, the one thing I'll note in Canada is the curve that the Canadian bond strategies have exposure to, which is that 10s, 30s curve, uh, has also normalized. We've seen, we started Q3 at minus 10 basis points, and we're now sitting at plus 10 basis points. So as that curve normalizes, you've got the steepener trade on, so it's favorable as long bonds uh, underperform the, the mid part of the curve. So that's been helpful. I guess shifting gears a little bit away from economic data um, and talking about investment returns. So it was a very strong quarter overall, both for equities and bonds. A bit of a Goldilocks scenario where both did particularly well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what worked in both asset classes? Yeah, I mean, I think it was definitely a really good quarter for asset prices. As you mentioned, you know, equities were up 5 to 10% on the quarter. A number of indices hit all-time highs. Uh, and I think what's really positive is where it was previously sort of AI and technology driven, uh, equity market performance has broadened out this quarter. You know, with central banks really pushing on that easing cycle, we saw interest rate sensitive sectors such as, you know, utilities, financials, real estate, all sort of leading the charge in terms of performance. In addition to equities being up on the quarter, bonds were also up. Uh, they were up almost 5% uh, on the quarter. And so, you mentioned sort of Goldilocks, this sort of idea of not too hot, not too cold. And I think that's exactly what happened in Q3. You know, growth was weak enough to allow central banks to ease policy, uh, which is really good for bonds and positives for, uh, you know, uh, interest rate sensitive equity sectors. Uh, but it was not too weak that, you know, there was an obvious sign of a recession happening. And so that Goldilocks environment or sort of that sweet spot where both bonds and equities do well is what we saw in Q3. So that's um, absolute returns or asset class level returns. Um, how did our balance strategy fare? Yeah, like I mentioned, returns were really strong on the quarter, well above long-term expectations. And I think it's important to remember that when you do have big swings like this in either direction, it's probably a bit overdone. And so I would cautious people uh, towards sort of extrapolating those types of returns. Uh, and we shouldn't be surprised if we get some give back on those. In terms of activity in the quarter for the balance portfolio, so you are part of the asset mix committee. Um, what, if any, actions did the committee take in the quarter and what, uh, what drove those actions? Yeah, we continue to move cash into bonds. Uh, it's something we've been doing slowly over the course of the year. And I think there's really two drivers of that decision. First, cash rates are falling. Uh, central banks are lowering the overnight rate. Uh, and that's causing yields on money market securities to decline. And so all else equal, you know, that makes cash less attractive on a relative basis. Uh, but the other factor is we do think the probability of a recession does exist. Uh, and bonds will provide the portfolio with better downside protection. And in addition, you know, inflation falling, central banks at the beginning of an easing cycle, we see this, the downside risks to bonds as having decreased. 
In terms of equities, uh, we continue to be neutral equities. Uh, and that's because we really do see the risks as balanced. You know, obviously there's the downside risks, recession risk, uh, geopolitical risk, but we do think there's sort of an equal probability that a soft landing plays out. And so with the risks being balanced, we believe neutral equities is the right thing to do. What do you make of the uh, contrast between, so you, you alluded to this earlier, slowing growth, um, slowing inflation, employment uh, as well, against a backdrop of a booming stock market and also very benign credit spreads. We haven't talked about credit spreads, but they've been uh, very well behaved for a number of quarters now. Is this kind of normal late cycle market behavior? Um, have we just, has the market just sort of skipped past this, this you know, concept of a no landing scenario? How do you sort of frame where we are in the cycle? Um, I guess less about what happened in the quarter and more zooming out, I guess, across cycles. Where, where would you sort of characterize we are in this cycle? Yeah, I mean, I think it is normal late cycle behavior, but maybe a better way to describe it is it's normal behavior after the central bank starts easing. You know, you can go back and look and regardless of whether or not the, the central bank easing corresponded to a recession or if it actually created a, a soft landing, uh, equities went higher, spreads went tighter after that first central bank cut. Um, and so both, you know, 2001, 2008, the Fed cut about three or four months before the uh, recession officially started. And equity markets actually went up in those uh, few months before eventually moving lower. In 95, they cut. Obviously, no recession hit that soft landing environment. Equity markets moved up and then continued to move up. And so I tend to think about, you know, what's happened over the last quarter uh, as a typical response to easing policy or at least moving into that easy, easier policy environment. Now, when we think about a framework that sort of helps us understand what drives markets or, you know, from a very high level, we tend to break things down by growth and policy. And I think last quarter, you had both of those things moving in a positive way, which is very good, very supportive of risk assets. So yes, you mentioned growth was slowing, but it's still positive. Uh, and policy went from restrictive to supportive. So you had tailwinds coming from both those directions. The question going forward is how long will those two factors be tailwinds? From a policy perspective, we're at the beginning of, of an easing cycle. So we believe that's going to remain supportive all year, which again is supportive for risk assets. I think the question mark really comes around growth. And it's, is that previous tightening still working its way through the economy? Is growth going to slow even more and potentially go negative? Or is growth going to level off? And I think that growth factor is really what's going to drive markets over the next kind of few quarters. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Crystal. Lots to think about there. Um, appreciate the framing as always um, and helping sort of cut through a lot of the noise in the markets and a uh, great synthesis of what's happened and what, what may come. Um, as always, uh, enjoy the conversation and hopefully talk to you next quarter. Great. Thanks a lot.